Hi, I'm David Hovel, and this is my YouTube channel, and welcome to my short course on music theory, broken into three parts, interspersed with uh, a little bit of demonstration video. Um, I'll be talking usually, usually using slides and explaining the basic concepts of music theory, and um, I think this will be a good review for people who know a bit. It might be new to a lot of people, but it's my particular way of looking at the problem of music theory using a few simple ideas repeated often. Now most of this information and a lot more is contained in my Kindle book which you can look up on Amazon Kindle. Just look for my name and you'll find a book that says Chords, Keys and Scales. That's me. It costs three dollars. Um, I really want you to know that for many years I've studied theory and I've taken many many songs apart and put them back together and I keep coming back to the same basic ideas. What is a scale? What, how do you form a chord? And what is the intersection, the logical and musical intersection between chords and scales? And why does that answer so many problems, including how to improvise, how to compose, and just how to sound like you know what you're doing, okay? So, uh, I'm going to stop now for this as an introduction. We're going to go into the slides, and then during the slides it will stop and show me again, and hopefully I'll give some demonstrations that will make some sense of what's going on in the slides. Hi, I'm David. This is my YouTube channel, and I'm presenting a series of videos uh, with some demonstrations about music theory, the basics of music theory. It's a very, very big subject, and a lot of people are very confused about things. I have a way of looking at things that I think might help people figure more about music than they ever thought they could. And I've got three parts to this initial series on music theory, and here we go into part one. There are three parts. The first part I call keys and scales, in which I'm going to talk about why there's 12 notes in an octave, what is an octave, making major scales from those 12 notes, what are key signatures, what are minor scales, and especially what is the circle of fifths, a very important idea. Second part is chord creation. What is a major chord? What is a minor chord? What chords can you use in what key? And the basics of fiddling around with chords to make things like sevenths and minor sevenths and a few other things. Part three covers more advanced chords. And that's like ninths and elevenths and thirteens and diminished and augmenteds and things that you might not think you need to know, but are really vital to being able to play a large repertoire of songs. So as I said, this is video number one, and we're going to get started right now. Keys and scales. And here's what we're going to talk about. What is an octave? What is a 12-tone scale? What's the musical definition of an interval? Talk about the all-important major scale pattern. How that results in all the key signatures that you can come up with. One for every note in the 12-tone scale. The, uh, some basic information on minor scales. And again, find, ending up with the circle of fifths. Keys and scales. M music is sound. Sound is vibrations. When you pluck a string, it vibrates at a certain frequency based on the weight of the string and the length of the string, not on how hard you plucked it. Otherwise, it would be impossible to play well. Um, when we hear a note, the human ear actually makes certain notes sound very, very similar. For example, if you play an A on a piano and an A on the guitar, your ear is going to say, yeah, those are really close. Another thing your ear will do is if you play a note that is exactly double of the previous note. Your ear is going to hear those two notes as being very similar, and you'll see this in the demonstration part of this video. That doubling is called an octave. Now, the term octave refers to eight notes, and this is the way music was considered in Western Europe um, until the invention of the 12-tone scale in the late 1700s and early 1800s. So the word octave refers to the eight notes that you think of as the white keys on a piano. And we'll get back to what that is, but remember, some of this terminology is, like in all fields, it's historical. Um, on the guitar, there's a 12th fret. When you get past the 12 notes of the, of the whole tone, of the, of the chromatic scale, you get to the 12th fret. And that is actually halfway, exactly halfway of the entire length of the string. So an octave really means a doubling, or inversely, a halving of the current frequency. And the way it, music works, and the thing that makes music work, is that when you do that, your ear hears that as being very, very similar. Well, there's a lot of ways to slice up the octave. 
And that is to say, every way that people play scales around the world, whether it's, uh, whether it's pen, uh, 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 pentatonic scales or 12-tone scales or anything else you're doing, and there's dozens and dozens of them if you read the literature, and I recommend Wikipedia for this. Um, the trick is you've got to divide it up in such a way that where when you get to the octave, when you get to that doubling, that's the pattern starts over. So every doubling is exactly the same pattern of notes. And the way the 12-tone scale was developed is a little complicated. It turns out 12 is a really good number for a lot of reasons. And there's some deeply acoustic reasons why 12 is a good number that I'm not going to get into. But there's good courses and other literature you can get that will explain all that to you. But the way it works is what you want is a magic number that, that will... Um, when multiplied by itself 12 times, get, get you to double. In other words, you're saying, I take a number, and I want to take a ma this magic number, and I want to multiply that number 12 times, one for each note, and when I get to the 12th time, it's exactly double where it started. Well, mathematically, that's the 12th root of 2. Don't worry about that. It boils down to you can compute where those frets on a guitar should be just by using a little arithmetic. Um, in the early days, they didn't really divide it up that way. What they had were some natural acoustic tones that were the eight notes of the octave. And they gave those notes uh, a set of names, which we now call C, D, E, F, G, A, and B, and then finally going back to C. Uh, there's a sign called sharp, which looks like a pound sign. That means move the note up one half step. On the guitar, that's one fret. And the flat sign means, means move it down a half step. Now on the piano, these octave notes, as I call them, are the white keys. Where there is an intervening note, a half step between, that uh, is going to be black. Some notes don't have them between, like E and F doesn't have one, B and C doesn't have one. This is the major scale pattern, which we'll talk about in a minute. So of these 12 note names, we, need, we have 12 notes, we need 12 names. We only have eight. So we talked about C, which is a well-known name, but the next half step above that we call C sharp, or you can call it D flat. The note above that is D, and the same thing with D sharp and E flat and so on. And if you count this, there's 12 individual notes, and there's 12 individual keys, because the entire octave, using the mathematical technique I described above, is divided into 12 parts. And you can call a note like C sharp or D flat, uh, exactly the same. It doesn't matter which you call it, but typically if it's in a key that has sharps, you call it by the sharp name, and if it's in a key that has flats, you call it by the flat name. Now an interval is just the distance between two notes, and um, you count them, unfortunately, by using the distance on the white keys of the piano. And the most important values to remember are the root or starting point, and some people call that one. The eighth note, which is the octave, which is 12 half steps or 12 frets on the guitar. The fifth, which is seven half steps. The fourth, which is five half steps. The major third interval, which is four half steps. And the minor third, which is three. So what we've got here is a situation where for guitarists, we should really call things the 12th or the 7th or the 5th, but, but we don't. We can't do that because historically music theory hasn't used that and most people read the clefs and use piano keyboards. So we are just out of luck as guitarists and violinists are in the same boat. We all have to just simply look at it and say, call it what people call it. There's reasons for it, I don't want to get into it. And then you've got the idea of an inverse of an interval where when you take an interval and you flip it on its head, um, take the second note first and the first note second. And for example, a fifth interval is a fourth and a fourth is a fifth, those are inversions. So now we know what an octave is. An octave is a time when a note is doubled. Here's a note. And there it is. And the trick is the human ear hears notes separated by a doubling of frequency as being very, very similar. So if I play this A, and then this A, and even this A, they all sound very much the same. And so the way I think of a scale, whatever the scale is, is not like a ladder, but like a circle. It starts in one point and it comes back around and all the relationships, all the chord 
uh, types and all the things that work in there just simply wrap around in a circle and they work the same in all octaves and then in all keys and we'll talk about that later. Well, as I said, music in the West, that is to say, you know, from Russia to the outer reaches of Alaska, in general uses 12 tones. In other words, they take the octave and divide it into 12 distinct notes. All the way up. That's a doubling of frequency. So by the time I've gone through 12, I am now double the frequency, and to the human ear it sounds the same. Um, on a piano, it's different. The piano was developed at a time when there was no 12-tone scale, when they were using more basic acoustics, and what they decided to do was break the octave, which everybody could hear, into seven different tones, or call it eight when you come back around to the end. Okay, so you count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's called the octave because the eighth is where it comes back to start. On the piano, the white keys are these notes. The stuff in between, that stuff is on the black keys. And the black keys and the white keys together, guess what? That's 12. It's just like a guitar. It's just that there's no easy way to do that on, guitar, on instruments like guitars and violins and mandolins and cellos because it's a continuous string we're dealing with. We don't have the luxury of having a bunch of independent strings stuck inside the piano box. Now, again, because we inherit a lot from our medieval ancestors, the names of the notes are stuck. So when we want to talk about C, that's simple. That's just C. Or D, that's just D. But when I want to talk about the note in between, there's no individual nice name for that. We have to call it either C-sharp or D-flat. In other kinds of tuning conventions, C-sharp and D-flat wouldn't actually be the same note. That's complicated. I don't want to get into that. For my purposes, C-sharp and D-flat are exactly the same note. Let's talk for a minute about intervals. An interval is simply the distance, and I count in frets, which other people call half steps between two notes. For example, if I play this note and then I play this note, that's two, two frets. And if I want to play like here, here's a, here is a major triad. That first interval goes from E to C sharp. And if you count, that's one, two, three, four. Then it goes from C to uh, G sharp to B, and that's one, two, three. So one interval has four half steps or frets. The next interval has three half steps or frets. And those are the main concepts we're going to talk about here. So what we're going to do is take the 12 we have available in the whole chromatic scale of 12-tone Western music and pick seven out of those. And that's called the major scale. Okay, now we're coming to some really important stuff. The way you make a major scale is fundamentally important, and the way to think about it is as a pattern of jumps. And think of it as frets. If I start on any note and skip two frets and take that note, and skip two frets and take that note, and then skip one fret and take that, and so on, in the pattern two, two, one, two, 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 one, I've created a major scale. In the case of C, that would be C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And that major scale pattern is exactly the same for every key. So if you start on D, you have D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. And when you look at that and say, G, to play this um, pattern of notes, the selection of notes, in D, I need F sharp and C sharp. That's where the key signature comes from. The key signature is simply starting from a root note, whether it's E flat or F, doesn't matter. You write out the major scale pattern, picking the notes as you rise from that root, and whatever sharps or flats you encounter along the way, that's the key signature. And because of the way the system works, you never need sharps and flats in the same key signature. There's either sharps or flats. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the other big secret of music, the first one was, of course, that, you know, that the octave sounds the same. The two notes that are an octave apart sound similar to your ear. The other big secret is if I play a melody and write down just the intervals and start it on C, Mary Had a Little Lamb, The Star Spangled Banner, whatever, 
I can move to any other root note and use the same pattern and it will sound very, very similar. It, you'll recognize immediately that you're playing the same song. It'll sound different because it's up the scale or down the scale some, but the pattern is the same. For this reason, a lot of music people use what are called Roman numerals because they preserve their relationships. If I write down notes or chords as Roman numerals rather than names, then I can look at the pattern and realize that, oh, this song has exactly the same pattern as some other song. Even though that song is in a different key and has different notes, the pattern of its notes, the pattern of its chords may be identical. And Roman numerals will really tell you that. And you just number them from one to eight and put flats and sharps in front of them as you need to. A key signature appears on a piece of music on a staff uh, right next to the clef, the bass clef or treble clef or whatever. And so in this example, in this slide, there's three flats, and they happen to be B flat, E flat, and A flat. I happen to know that that's the key of E flat major, and I'll show you how to figure that out in a minute. And now we're coming to one of the other really, really important concepts in all of music. Virtually every song you ever play or sing uses only the notes from a single key for the entire song. Once in a while, there may be notes that are out there that are not in the key as, as, as emphasis notes, or every so often you might change into a different key for the bridge of the song or to make it more exciting. But 99 times out of 100, for the songs most people play and the songs people love, those songs are absolutely locked on the notes of a single key. That's all that is used. And the other message that's very closely related is the notes that are, that are played in the chords that make up the chords also come from that key. So if a chord has a note that's not in that key, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's not going to be played in that song. And from here on out, we're going to talk about key signatures, just re referring to them as note names. So once again, the big take-home message here is you've got a major scale pattern. You pick a, a root note, and it tells you what key you're in, whether it's C or G or D. Then that tells you the, the, the eight notes that you can safely use. There's only seven unique notes. The seven notes you normally use, and that's what the song is written to be sung in. And all the chords that are used in that key are made up of, of groups of those notes. Now, I'm only going to briefly mention the minor scale because there's, a bit, there's some complexities about the minor scale. But the most important thing to remember is that every major key, like C minor, has what's called a relative minor key, in this case, A minor. And it's exactly the same pattern with a different starting point. And the relative minor key starts on the sixth tone of the major scale. So in C, the sixth tone is A. So if you take the same uh, um, uh, pattern, but if you take the major scale pattern and you simply write it out long and start at the sixth point and just go on for eight notes, you'll find that you've created a minor scale pattern. So every major scale, if extended, has a minor scale in it and vice versa. So the C major scale, as we know, is C to shining C. If you start on A and simply loop the chart, you get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. All those notes are in the C major scale, but when you play it in that order and using chords that are structured around that root, it sounds minor and it is minor. I think of these as an endless circle. I think of the 12 notes in the octave as an endless circle, and within that I pick out the major scale notes, and that's an endless circle. If I'm playing in a minor key, I just start the same pattern a little further down the way. The consequence of this is that, is that A minor will have exactly the same key signature as C because they use the same notes. There are other altered minor scales that's a little too advanced to get into here, but I can talk about it maybe in a future video. Welcome back. Well, you just heard about scale patterns. And a scale pattern is simply what are the jumps from one note to the other that make a major scale. I'm going to use C here for just a second. So I've got C, and I'm going to do it up the neck. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now, nobody plays like that because we have extra strings, so we can play it. And that pattern, two, two, one, two, 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 one, is magical because that's the same 
pattern as the minor scale, simply a different starting point. So the way I think of it is kind of like the worm Arboros swallowing its own tail. You start at C and you come back around to C and you start over again. If you're on a minor scale, let's say you want to stay in the key of C, you want to use A minor, it's just A and around to A. But the pattern of the minor scale is the same thing, a different starting point. So. That's the minor scale pattern. It's the same as the major scale pattern, it just starts on a different point. You take the major scale pattern, write it as a circle, and start on the sixth tone. It's the same thing. Now, if I play a set of chords like this, C, A minor, F, and G, like old uh, Shaboom songs from the 50s. Now, I can play the same relative set of chords in G. They sound very similar because the same chords bear, these chords bear the same relationship to each other in other keys. So I can play a melody, any melody, and I can transpose it to any one of 12 keys. And along the way, I can transpose those chords. Um, and those uh, ideas will hold you in good stead throughout everything you study, that all the keys are really the same. And what you do is you change it based on especially the vocalist and whatever her vocal range might or might not be and on what people like to play. And guitar players like sharp keys. A lot of jazz players like flat keys. doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're looking at the relationships between these things. Um, the main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that when you're playing a song... All the notes of the song are almost always right out of that song's key. When you're playing chords, all the notes in the chords are also out of that key, okay? And as a simple example, let's say that I'm playing a C and I go to an F and then I go to a G. Those are, those are the main three chords in the key of C. We'll get into this later. Then have, here's an F chord, B flat and C. That's in the key of F. But if I'm playing a, a, a C chord and then the song changes to an F chord, I don't change into the key of F. I don't start playing a B flat. I play the notes in the key of C over the chord F and emphasize those notes that are in that chord. So whenever you're improvising, you're not doing a pattern of improvisation per chord, you're doing it based on the key scale that you're in. Very important. A lot of people get this wrong, and you can immediately hear that something isn't quite right. So, um, again, if you know that pattern of the, minor, of the major scale and the minor scale, which just starts at a different point, and you think of it as an endless circle winding higher and higher into the octaves, you can't go wrong here. We're going to learn how, in a minute, all these chords are constructed from just those notes. Okay, here's the one that blows everybody's mind. This is the circle of fifths. Now, why does it, why does it have that name? Well, if you look at the 12 o'clock guy, that's C. Underneath it, it has, in darker letters, A minor. That means that C is the major scale, and A minor is the related minor scale or the relative minor scale. Notice there's no key signature thing above C because C doesn't have any. C, does, C has no sharps and no flats. Um, now let's move to one, one pie slice to the right and you see that that's G. What's the relationship there? Well the relationship is that G is the fifth tone in C. If you move another one and go to D, D is the fifth tone in G. So what that means is as you move clockwise Around the circle of fifths, you're jumping to fifth tones. Likewise, if you move counterclockwise, from C to F is, a, is the fourth. F is the fourth note in the key of C, the C scale. And therefore, when you go counterclockwise, you're moving on a circle of fourths. And in each of these, if you notice, as you go clockwise, G has one sharp, D has two sharps, a has three sharps, and so on. Uh, where do these come from? All it means is you take that pattern, two, two, one, two, 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 one, and start on the note 
that it in, is indicated in the pie slice, like say D, and you wind up noting that you must play an F sharp and a C sharp to be able to play in D. It's pretty straightforward. Um, don't worry about the stuff at the bottom. Those are keys that almost nobody ever uses that actually overlap. But most of the time, most guitar players are going to play in C, G, D. They're going to play in the sharp keys. Sometimes in F, sometimes in B flat. Most guitar players don't mess around with E flat very much. But if you play jazz, you got to be able to play in E flat. That's another story. So this is the magic of the circle of fifths. And this brings us to the end of the first part of my talk. Okay, so now you've heard about the circle of fifths. And the main thing to learn about that is how these keys are related. Um, so for example, if I'm playing C, going counterclockwise, it's the fourth, that's F. Coming clockwise, one wedge, that's G. And C, F, and G, the one, the four, and the five major chord, are the primary chords inside the major key. If I want to take A minor, which is the same key signature as C, it's four is D minor, it's five is E minor, back to A minor. So the circle of fifths, immediately you take the chord you're looking at, the key you're looking at, and you, and you go to the, you go counterclockwise to pick up your fourth, clockwise to pick up your fifth, and those are your three primary chords in any given key. It's just a little trick. The main thing about keys to remember is they're all built on the same scale pattern. 2-2-1, two, 2-2-2-1. Two, one, two, 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 one. Okay, the minor scale pattern is the same thing, only starting at the sixth. Um, but the chords are structured using notes from the key, and they're structured using a set of patterns that we're going to talk about in the next video. So the bottom line is, they're all the same. I can take a song and I can play C, A minor, F and G, I can play D, B minor, G, I can play E, C sharp minor, in other words, I could do any of those, and it really depends on what the singer wants to do or what the instrumentalists want to do, but the melody simply shifts up or down, maintaining all the same intervals between the notes. The chords shift up or down and maintain the same intervals, so that in fact there's really no uh, change at all. It's just a change in location. It's like playing you know, ping pong in Hong Kong versus playing ping pong in San Francisco. Same game, you're just in a different location. The other thing that I wanted to mention here is it's really important to hear the difference between a major chord and a minor chord. Here's E, here's E minor. You hear that kind of ringing sadness in there? Here's D, here's D minor. That difference, major or minor, is the most important distinction that your ear can learn. After you think you can distinguish that really well, which most people can, then you want to get into things like sevenths, okay, and the later ninths, okay, and, and move on from there. Um, you can get into minor sevenths, but then it gets difficult because sometimes a, a, a D minor seventh sounds a lot like an F sixth, and many times you can substitute one for the other. But the biggest difference is to hear major from minor. The rest of it you can pick out because most of the time to learn a song, all you really have to do is pick out a note you're hearing and that will tell you, one, or better still, one chord. If you can pick one chord, you can guess one of three keys that it's going to be. And then you pick up the key and then you know the structure and you can go from there. But it begins with a bit of ear training and a bit of logic.